Good evening and welcome to this special literary edition of Q&A with the Melbourne Writers' Festival. I'm Tony Jones. Here to answer your questions, the award-winning author of Tomorrow When the War Began, John Marsden. Short story writer and author of Foreign Soil, Maxine beneva Clark, The Miles Franklin award-winning author of The Choke, Sophie Laguna. The author of The Lebs, Dr Michael Mohammed Ahmed. And journalist-turned-novelist Trent Dalton, whose new book is Boy Swallows Universe. Please welcome our panel. Thank you. Now, Q&A is live in Eastern Australia on ABC TV, iView and News Radio. Somewhere in Canberra, our politicians are caught up in an absurdist fiction. But tonight we're handing the discussion to writers with something... We'll really have something to say. Um, our first question tonight comes from Ian, uh, so Ian Abbey. Thank you, Tony. Have any of the panellists ever felt uneasy, uncomfortable or unsafe when dining in a Melbourne restaurant? Maxine, how about you? <laughs> I think I probably make people feel uneasy and uncomfortable due to current uh, media reports, but no, I haven't. I mean, I live in Melbourne's West. Um, I've lived in Melbourne's West for about seven years now, and I've never felt uncomfortable dining there or anywhere else in Melbourne. So you've never been chased out of a restaurant by an African crime gang? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. And I think, you know, there's this thing of this... You know, Chimamanda Adichie talks about this danger of a single story, and this is what we're seeing here, and signified even perhaps by the fact that the first question on this panel is about, you know, African gangs, that we're not seeing any other narrative coming out of, of African Australia. Um, I've been working for the last few weeks um, on a book. Uh, there's a brilliant book that's just come out called Growing Up Aboriginal in Australia that everyone should read. Um, and what that book does is kind of dispel these myths of a single story. And I've been reading these stories for the next edition, which is Growing Up African in Australia. And it's just this cacophony of voices about growing up in the country, you know, people helping their dads with their, you know, fix their cars or people becoming dancers, people becoming actors. This kind of um, richness of the African-Australian community that we're just not seeing anywhere and that's why this is so harmful that um, you know I guess with other um, a lot of other ethnic groups you might have you know maybe a woman is kind of raped by a white man but the next story is about a white male cricketer and it's a positive story but in this case all we're getting is this one particular narrative and I think that's why it's so harmful. How about you John? No I've never felt unsafe in a Melbourne restaurant except uh, if the wine list is inadequate I kind of get a little <laughs> Nervous, but... That's um, a really tough middle-class problem you've got there. <laughs> yeah, not easy. But, no, I think there's a tendency in our society to demonise a group or groups, and it seems to be a cultural phenomenon that we've carried out and uh, inherited for generations. And at the moment, it happens to be Af African uh, people in, in Melbourne, but next year it will be a different group, no doubt, as at, and it's been a different group right through my lifetime. When I was a kid, it was Greek and Italian people, and then it became... Asian people, Vietnamese people firstly, and then other Asian people. Now it's um, uh, African people and Aboriginal people have been kind of chronically treated in this way for the whole of my life. And so I think we need to look at why, as a society, we find otherness so difficult and so confronting, why we find it so uncomfortable and, uh, and frightening to meet people and mingle with people who have different experiences of life and perhaps different cultural backgrounds. Even how, about, how about you, Sophie? It's a, it's a strange question to ask in a way, but it's relevant, obviously, given the answers. No, I don't think I've... Um, I can't remember being feeling fearful in, uh, in a Melbourne restaurant, um, but it's deeply concerning the way we have politicised this particular violence at the moment. And, and it needs to be a problem that we look at um, as, a, as, a, as a policing problem, I think, purely and simply, and never anything else. And, and uh, it's, it's so destructive and divisive to do so. Mohammed, mm. um, I know you don't live here, but... No, I don't, I don't live in Melbourne, but it doesn't matter, because actually... My experience as an Arab Australian Muslim is that I don't feel safe in Australia most of the time. Mm. Um, I, I want to add something to it. My name is both Michael and Muhammad. That's kind of the condition of being a minority and living in Australia, that you have to live strategically between two identities all the time. And, you know, when somebody asks you your name, it should be the most immediate thing. It's one of the first things you're given when you're born. And so... The idea that you go into a restaurant in Australia 
and somebody takes your order and says to you, what's your name? And you have to hesitate. You have to ask yourself, do I tell them my name is Mohammed? Is a tragedy. And it's disgusting that our politicians and our government has let the demon of xenophobia bring us to this point. Trent. Um, no, I've never uh, felt unsafe in a Melbourne restaurant. Um, I, I love what Maxine's saying about every element of the story. We're storytellers. That's how you tell a story. And right now, my hope is for those boys, um, you know, whose lives, they've been thrown the worst hand, um, you know, and that, that, that I hope their lives don't, that, that, that journey that they've had in Australia doesn't define where they're at in life and that they can write their own story again. Right now, it's probably being written for them. And um, I really hope those boys start to get part of the story and they can write it themselves. And, and that's how we get those different perspectives. Well, let's go to the part of the story that's unfolding in Canberra as we speak. Uh, we've got a question from Michael Vukovic. The tenure of Prime Minister Turnbull is once again the subject of intense speculation. If Peter Dutton were to become Prime Minister, do you believe that his actions and statements regarding African gangs and refugees would harm or help the coalition at the next election? Uh, is, oh, sorry, go ahead. Is dog whistle politics becoming a more or less successful tactic in Australian politics? OK, we'll start with Mohammed again. Um, I don't know the answer to the question, will it be harmful or not, because I still am not sure just how much the influence and the rise of white supremacy has infiltrated the minds of Australian citizens. But I will say this about Peter Dutton, that two years ago he made comments about Lebanese Australian Muslims, specifically second generation Lebanese Australian Muslims. That's me. He, in, he said that we're a mistake, that it was a mistake for the Fraser government to allow our parents into this country. And I, I have to say that when I heard those comments, it was the first time that I probably felt extremely proud to call myself a Lebanese Australian Muslim because I thought to myself, I would prefer to wake up every morning knowing I'm a mistake and doing everything I can to make this country the best place it can be than to be brought into this world intentionally and to mean nothing but to cause havoc and trouble and bigotry. So, Trent... Okay, you're a Queenslander, Queenslander uh, Peter yeah. Dutton's a Queenslander. And the, que the question goes to, you know, will uh, these kind of comments that Dutton has made and famous for, African gangs, mm. the Lebanese comments and others, uh, and mm. his role as the immigration minister, will they help him in Queensland? Because some people are saying, well, if he becomes prime minister, we'll win a lot of seats in Queensland we otherwise mm. would have lost. Well, we're currently in a situation in Australia where there are anger votes and there are rage votes, and they're all up for grabs. And some of these comments that we're seeing from our leaders are, are, are genuinely appealing to those to trying to, to get their share of those votes. Um, the biggest question, it's our responsibility as journalists to, to go deeper into those, into those comments and, and, and spend longer times with them, longer interviews, long-form journalism, to really dig deep and go right around the issues, come in from the left, come in from the right, and you know, and that's what you see good journalists trying to do today. And uh, but yeah, I mean, look, there will always be those people who re will respond to those comments, no doubt, especially in my beloved home state. Maxime, um, you know, the uh, yeah, the idea of a Dutton prime minister it just fills me with terror. I mean, I think that. I'm still an idealist. I think a lot of writers are idealists. You know, our job is to really reimagine the world or imagine a different world. And I guess I like to believe that you know that one political party is going to win the election, but you hope that the person who becomes prime minister is a big enough person that they can be bipartisan on the issues that matter and that the people who haven't voted for them will still see them as some kind of a representation of themselves. Mm -hmm. And... I mean, there are a whole heap of Prime Ministers who haven't been that for Australia, but I still hope that one day someone who will come along who is, and Dutton certainly is not that person. So it all just seems like Lord of the Flies again for me. John, what do you think? Yeah, there's a big difference between what the Swiss psychologist Piaget called formal thinkers or abstract thinkers and concrete thinkers, and... Concrete thinkers who can only understand what's tangible, what can be seen, 
what they've experienced themselves and can't have, understand uh, complex, profound, subtle uh, ambiguities, are unable to communicate very effectively. And I'll talk about politics outside Australia for a moment. Someone like Trump is easy to understand when you realise that he's a concrete thinker who's been elected by concrete thinkers. And if you use the language that appeals to concrete thinkers, you will have a considerable degree of electoral success. And I think Dutton is someone like that who uh, is very much in that category and appeals to people who are in that category. But when you hear a conversation between a concrete thinker and a formal or abstract thinker, you realise that they might as well be... One might be speaking in Bulgarian and the other in uh, Swahili for all the sense that they can make of each other's uh, arguments. They just have great difficulty understanding the other person's point of view because it's almost like a different language. And so, yeah, it's a constant tension between these two different types of thinking. Sophie, what do you think? Well, I could relate to what Maxine was saying about um, uh, that idealism. When I heard it on the news this morning, I just I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it could be true. And I confess that a part of me, a part of me almost hungered for the drama. I almost wanted to see something. <laughs> I wanted to see something about... Um, uh, something unsettled, but um, maybe that's just me hoping for a, a better outcome. Is that because you're bored with politics <laughs> as it is? You'd like no, to see it I, become I just, more exciting? I, just, I want radical weirder. change. Radical. I want radical change, mm. and I thought, is this, is, will this get us there more quickly? Um, uh, but truth is stranger than fiction. I, I was stunned that, that this could be happening again. Um, and, and I can't get my head around Dutton at the moment as, as Prime Minister can't happen, but I said the same thing about Trump, so I could be wrong. Mm. How about Julie Bishop? That's the other option, that uh, people <laughs> decide that Dutton is too extreme, let's go for someone else. Uh, Julie Bishop so you're comes asking... through the pack, like the modern Australian <laughs> Margaret Thatcher. But... <laughs> She's a talented woman. Um, the, the, the thing I've been thinking about, we're storytellers, right? This is a, this is a fiction night. And, a, and, you know, picture these people as heroes in a novel. And it's almost like a Dan Brown-esque thriller. <laughs> and, uh, and we want these people to succeed. We want to go all the way with these people because it's our country at stake. We want that whole final end to the book to be wonderful. And there's this wonderful thing called Choices Under Pressure. It's a narrative device. And usually at the end of a book, sometimes if you're struggling for you know, a nice sort of concept or something, you can think of Choices Under Pressure. And we have been seeing in this country each time our politicians face choices under pressure. They, we either get backflip or we get walk away or we, we get these different things. These, these, they're not meeting the challenge of choices under pressure. And, and in the books, that's when you find true character. And, uh, and it's really an interesting sort of study to think about how people deal with pressure. And if you don't deal with choices under pressure enough times, everyone's going to put the book down and they're going to go watch Netflix. And, uh, and that's, that's sort of where we're at with politics, I feel, in Australia. Yes, a novel written by a very deeply disturbed writer. <laughs> Sometimes. Um, let's, let's move on. Our next question is from Lily Mays. A week ago on Sky News, United Patriots fronts Blair Cottrell, a man who was admitted to liking Hitler and been found guilty of violence against women, made comments about restoring Australia's traditional identity and the need to protect the people of this country against foreign ideologies. And last week, Senator Anning claimed that the final solution to the immigration problem should be a Muslim ban. Do you think that the media should censor this type of behaviour or is it crossing the line of freedom of speech? Maxime, start with you. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, if you're talking about really the infiltration of Australia, you know, this, this is black country that we're all sitting on. You know, this is Indigenous land. And so I think it's really ludicrous that we can talk in any way about immigration without actually thinking about the way that this country was founded. And I feel like we're never going to get anywhere on race until there's a reckoning in terms of Indigenous sovereignty. Um, I think that all of those comments really are... Um, you know, it's again that thing, the danger of a single story. There has been migration. I mean, we had the white Australia policy for quite some time, yes. But there has been immigration from all different countries to this country. There were 11 people of African descent on the first fleet. Australia's first 
bushranger. Black Caesar was an African. Um, you know, we'd like to think it was Ned Kelly, the most prominent bushranger. <laughs> Australia's only known pirate was of African descent. Blues Point in Sydney was named after an African. So, you know, we like to think that this is a new problem and that we need to come up with a fast solution to fix this kind of imminent problem. But that's really a, a, um, a politician's spin on the issue. The reality is that, you know, um, race problems have existed in this country since white arrival and they start with um, really us reckoning with how this country was founded and building up from there. But I think anything else that doesn't take into account this long history of migration and of race relations, it's just, um, it's just politics. It's purely about vote scoring. Maxine, your, um, your memoir, new memoir, The Hate Race, um, tracks back to when you are a little child and your memories of racism overt and covert uh, when you were a kid. I mean, uh, you, you sense that things have changed or, or because of what you're hearing, have changed very little. Um, I feel like there was kind of like almost some movement in the 80s, you know. Um, but, you know, you see Hansenism coming back. You know, Hansen arrived in the 90s when I was at high school. I saw personally what effect that had on me, you know, in the schoolyard. We like to think of these things as abstract, that they're just kind of politics going on. But they have these, they have real impacts on people's lives. And I see that we're going backwards. I think everybody sees that we're going backwards. And I don't think that is a problem of, of migration. I think it's a problem of politics and it's about how we see ourselves as a country. And I, I just think we're better than this. Can I just quickly ask you, what does the title The Hate Race actually mean? Because it strikes me as being a bit <laughs> ambiguous, maybe deliberately ambiguous. Yeah, well, um, probably um, something that people don't know is that I'm a massive reality television fan. No. <laughs> <laughs> so The Amazing Race was one of my favourite um, shows, you know, back in the day. So it's not about the amazing it, white Well, no, race. it just seemed to me that my life was, you know, The Amazing Race, they go around and have to collect different clues. Right. And my life as a child was just constantly being ping-ponged into these situations that were to do with race, you know, whether it was being sent to the back of the line at the service station or sent. Mm. So it's not an indictment of a race, but, I mean, that's what the book is about. It's about, you know, my life as seen through the lens of race. That's okay, we'll come back and talk more about that in a little while. Trent, um, the questioner asks whether censorship is appropriate in this case. Um, do you see that invention there, the television camera? Um, I love that invention. It, it gave me Mallory Keaton from Family Ties. It gave me Winnie Cooper <laughs> from The Wonder Years. But I think it also does bring us some dangerous things. And... Um, and we are seeing this now where a camera is laid on a person with a voice, a loud voice, and um, they throw what's called a dead cat on the table. Um, Boris Johnson spoke about this. You know, votes are down, throw a dead cat on the table. It'll mesmerise people. Um, and this is kind of the world we're, we're kind of moving into. And, and, um, and our job um, definitely is to question this, um, which is why you you hear a speech by Fraser Anning and the first thing, you know, and I was really proud of um, journalism, you know, in this past week and how everyone, you know, first thing, every news organisation throws their best people onto this, right? So we at the Oz, we throw Caroline Overington on, on it and she pulls out this Tommy gun of truth and just shoots it to bits, you know, and, uh, and then, you know, Lee Sales will come in from the other side and Davis, David Spears will come in and what you can't do is let that camera roll, you know, and sit on that person, zoom in and let it roll like a YouTube video. You know, we need to make sure we're always keeping these people honest and testing these speeches. Um, some incredible things were said in that speech. And, uh, you know, it's not necessarily the person who's saying it that I worry about. I, I worry about the people who's buying, who are buying the T-shirt. You know, and uh, that's what we have to sort of worry about sometimes with these inflammatory speeches. Mm. Why it rolled so long? Why was it given so much space? Why did I hear about it all day, repeated? Yeah, well... Uh, partly because it was so shocking, I think. I mean, uh, you, to get a senator to stand up in his maiden speech and refer to the final solution... So, something It is unbelievable, yeah. actually. But I think that's why it rolled on so long, to be honest with you. And the interesting thing about that is that immigration, what we have here as far as our refugee, global refugee systems all date back to the Holocaust. Like, it's a fascinating thing that those were the words he used. Let's not forget he wanted it to roll on, and that's why those words were chosen. Mohammed. Um, it's not new rhetoric. This is uh, something that I've been hearing my entire life. I'm 32 years old, and I've 
been an Australian for 32 years. And um, this kind of hysteria, the language, um, reinstate a white Australia policy, ban immigration from the Muslim world, ban people of colour, um, has a cyclical model. We hear it every couple of months. And every time the Muslim community hears it, there's a script that we have to follow. We have to say, stop being uh, racist towards us. Stop stereotyping us. Stop essentializing us. Don't be afraid of us. We mean you no harm. How does that work out for the Muslim community when we follow that script? How did it work out for our sister Yasmin Abdul Majid? If anybody who knows her told you about her, they tell you she's the nicest person you've ever met. And she was still treated like a member of ISIS. You see, that's the point, that it makes no difference what kind of a Muslim you are. Good Muslim, bad Muslim, ignorant Muslim, educated Muslim, moderate Muslim, radical Muslim, still Muslim. And so at this point in time, I'm not interested anymore in reassuring bigots not to be afraid of me. My position is actually quite the opposite. My position now is this. If you're a racist, if you're a white supremacist, an imperialist, a colonialist, an orientalist, an Islamophobe and a xenophobe, you should be afraid of me because I stand in solidarity with the majority of the people on this planet who are saying no to you, and we are going to stop this bigotry and hatred that you're spreading. Let's, let's be clear. <laughs> Mohammed, in your case, you're talking about with your pen or your typewriter, correct? Um, <clears throat> because you're worried that I'm implicating some kind of violent action. No, I'm giving you the opportunity to say you aren't. <laughs> well, of course I'm not, but I've got to be dead honest. I always find it really cheap when I'm being, when, when, when there's a concern that Muslims are inciting violence, because if you looked at the foreign policies of the West, it's the, they are the most violent people on the planet. OK, John. Yeah, there's... One of the things in our society is that we have this kind of messianic complex where we want some great leader to emerge from somewhere and lead us all to a better place, and we yearn for that, and we vote for that, and we're inevitably disillusioned and crushed when that person fails to live up to the ridiculous expectations we have of them. So we need to accept more responsibility as a community and to not look to the messianic leader to solve our problems, but to do things at a ground level, at a micro level, that will help the community. When I was about 10, I read one line in a Reader's Digest, which I'm a little embarrassed to admit when I'm surrounded by the literati of Australia, but um, it was loving the Sorry, loving the world is easy. Loving the guy next door is what's difficult. And solving the world's problems is easy when we talk about them in grand terms, but actually not using so much plastic and turning off our heaters when they don't really need to be on and being civil to the person who lives next door to us or who works next to us seems to be incredibly difficult for many people. And so to balance the kind of arguments of these extremists who are getting a lot of media space... We need people who can lead discussion which is reasoned, which is thoughtful, which is uh, empathetic and which will really help society to advance. But we can't expect some extraordinary figure to emerge from the clouds and, uh, and fix everything for us. It's got to be us working along in our daily lives. OK, I've got a question specifically for you, John. It's from Eliska Yusipovic. So through John Marsden's novel Tomorrow on the War Began and the movie Adaptation... Have we raised a generation in fear of invasion? I hope not, Aliska. It was written 20 or so years ago when no one talked about the security of Australia and it always amused me, really, that we could go a whole year or longer without any conversation about whether we should be worried about our borders or securing our, our safety. So I did have that vaguely in the back of my mind when I wrote the book, but really the books are... a. I mean, war is just a, a, a useful device in the books for putting young people under pressure and seeing how they will cope with that pressure. But war is great in that way for a novelist because you see everything magnified in a war situation. If two people fall in love in the middle of a war, that's more intense than if they fall in love when they're working at an insurance office in Collins Street, Melbourne. <laughs> so, um, John, do you think it would be harder in this day and age, a more politically correct day and age, it would be fair to say, would it be harder to write a novel about young 
uh, young kids who are actually form a resistance movement to fight against what appears to be an Asian invading force. Yeah, I wouldn't write that book now, not because of societal views in a way, but because of my own uh, horror at the way refugees who've come to Australia have been treated. And when I hear the political debate raging every day, and this is now relegated to just a footnote in the pages of Hansard, rather than the overwhelmingly important topic that it should be, when I see people who arrive here legitimately seeking refuge and, and, and shelter, and they are treated as the scum of the earth, and they are sentenced to awful detention and sometimes death by both major political parties without any apparent scruples or conscience exhibited by those parties, then that would put me in a very different position when it came to writing a book about um, threats to Australia because demonising people like that is unforgivable and it's disgusting and it's a, an ongoing obscenity in our lives. I right. think at the same time... Yes, sir. <laughs> sir, <make it. laughs> Um, I think at the same time, I've, I've recently read Alice Pung's essay on, on John's work where she talks about how much it meant to her growing up as, as a child whose family had experienced war and experienced displacement and that kind of familiarity. You know, we can't assume that people reading these books are middle-class kids who have had no experience of those kinds of things. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think I, I have... I grew up reading John's books. Um, <laughs> I think... You know, and now my son reads them as well, and I think mm. that... Um, you know, we, everything, times change. You know, I have no doubt that books that I have written in 20 years' time, maybe even in 10 years' time, I'll look back and think there's no way I would write that now. And I think what we do is we read them in that context. You know, we read them with this awareness of when they were written and, you know, what, what was trying to be said at the time um, because that's, that's the only thing yeah. we can do. Well, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking... That what's brought the five of us here on this panel is the work that we do as writers of fiction, predominantly. So what is our work able to do as far as addressing some of the issues that have come up tonight? What is the role of fiction in, 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 in the issues that we're facing as a culture? I think it's to explore issues and to try to get a little closer to the truth of those issues, even though the truth itself will always remain elusive. But if you can inch a little closer to understanding something, then fiction has done something remarkable and worthwhile. But in writing the Tomorrow series, I wanted to show people that young Australians who were treated with contempt were actually capable of greatness. And when put under pressure, they would not run home and hide under the bed or burst into tears and call for their mothers or fathers. They would actually dig deep and find the, the kind of courage that humans have always found under pressure. And uh, it was really a, a, a way of demonstrating that to a readership. Mm. My Max, book, I, uh, sorry, no. Go. No, well, I, I remember when I read The Hate Race, I was, um, my world was expanded by it and I felt enormous compassion for the, for the struggle that you had endured as a child. And although, of course, I was aware of the racism, you know, in those particular decades, in that decade, um, I felt it in a much more visceral, personal way kind of a way and I suppose that is what we have to offer isn't yeah. it mm. you know that is that's our... right through through fiction you can go so deep into the humanity and uh and I've, I've found mm. this myself like writing a bloody book mm. and you you realize these answers about your own life about the mm. lives of the people you love yeah and you mm. find that truth through a completely adventurous mm. fantastical world Mohammed, do you, do you agree with that i mean you've you've chosen to delve into um, part of your own life uh with the lebs mm. um your novel your recent novel and it's quite um an extraordinary and visceral experience which you live through what's the question the question is are you also using your experiences to tell us a story about australia um Look, I've got to be and, and, I, and I guess yeah. to change Australia or perceptions yeah. about certain people in this country. Uh, the answer is yes. But I don't think there's any literature in Australia that doesn't do that. And so I would really like to answer the mm. question from the audience member um, about uh, the Tomorrow series. Because, you know, it, it is about 20 years old. And I remember growing up in the western suburbs of Sydney where there was tremendous xenophobia towards Vietnamese Australian communities. And uh, with all due respect, the language of the book and the implications in the book genuinely impacted and damaged the lives of a lot of the young people 
that I grew up around. And, um, you know, for me, reading, it's not about the ability to put words together. It's about the ability to pull words apart. And when I pulled the words apart in the Tomorrow series, I did interpret a paranoid white nationalist fantasy about a group of coloured people illegally invading this country. And I always find that narrative deeply ironic because that's what the white population did to the indigenous population. Uh, John, do you, I'll give you a quick <laughs> chance to respond no, to that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, any book that's uh, got some passion and is exploring difficult topics will alienate some people yeah. and attract other people. So uh, that's, I'm fine with people having that response to the book. Um, but throughout history, almost every country has been constantly invaded and re-invaded and colonial Australia has been pretty lucky to go 200 years or more without another invasion happening. But, um, yeah, I've written elsewhere and in Tomorrow When the War Began, I've alluded to the European invasion of Australia in 1788. But, uh, yeah, I'm happy for anyone to react to my work in whatever ways they react. It's, uh, I'd rather have that than just write a bland book which people read and forget. OK, let's move on. Remember, if you hear any doubtful claims on Q&A, let us know on Twitter. Uh, keep an eye on our RMIT ABC Fact Check and the Conversation website for the results. The next question comes from Emily Hand. The Artistic Director of the Melbourne Writers' Festival, Marie Hardy, says that she wouldn't invite Jermaine Greer to speak at her um, discussions because she's not interested in having debates that hurt people. Um, this follows Jermaine Greer being uninvited from the Brisbane Writers' Festival. Um, it, but isn't the role of arts festivals to promote discussions and debates, even if they aren't attractive or appealing to a lot of people, as long as they're reflective of society? Sophie, we'll start with you. My first thought is we need Marie here, really, to, to explain her decision, because there must, there must be more to it, I think. Um, she must have felt that Jermaine's argument would hurt people. I can't... I mean, I, I, I think the same thing as you, that um, writers' festivals are, are about being provoked and sharing of ideas and how dangerous can the sharing of ideas be, really? But, um, but she had her reasons and, and, and I respect her, her opinion. On, and I, uh, I need to uh, on, more, on the disinvitation from Brisbane, it's, it's sort of clear because they say the new book on rape is considered too contentious. Um, to discuss. But how, uh, Marika, how, Marika how, is saying how, she yeah. doesn't want to have discussions which are hurtful, so she's yeah. trying to do something positive uh, with her festival. So it's a slightly different okay. emphasis. But uh, in Brisbane, it's clear uh, they didn't want her, they didn't want Bob Carr, because his arguments about China um, were also yeah. considered to be too contentious. So, so, so the organisers of the Brisbane Writers' Festival are imagining that a conversation about... Um, Women's role in, in, in being raped, is, that's what Germain's putting forward, um, is going to hurt victims of sexual violence. Um, but it's difficult to imagine, it's difficult to, for me to imagine that a conversation like that could, could hurt, even if it provokes, even if people are upset by it. Isn't that, isn't that a useful thing? I mean, Germain's doing it intentionally, isn't she? That's always been her role. So, uh, she has been a lifelong provocateur. That's There's no right. question about that. That's right. And even her being disinvited. But is... There are people who've been hurt by some yeah. of the things she said. Um, think about uh, the transsexual uh, community and I suppose yes. there is a fear that she can step over the line from time to time. Well, she but, does step over but the is line. That, is it the role of provocateurs, writers, to step over the line? It is, isn't so it? So you can have I a debate. I would have thought so. Yeah. I would have thought so. She needs to be that voice, doesn't she? She's mm. playing the devil's advocate so that we can come in and argue with her and mm. strengthen our, our, our ideas around it, this. It's utterly compelling. And, and who isn't going to walk into a room where Jermaine Greer is letting rip? You know, I mean, yeah. come Were you surprised on. at Brisbane Writers' Festival? Oh, it's your town. Yeah. <laughs> You'll be there. I love all the people involved, but it's madness. Madness. Yeah. It, it was it, like, Bob Carr, like, are you kidding me? Yeah. I'd go see both of them, you know, in a heartbeat, mm. you know, and... Uh, and I just think, you know, are we getting so soft that we can't sort of, you know, handle these deep discussions mm. about the... Are we, are, we are mature enough to deal with the things that Jermaine mm. is talking about. My issue is sometimes she can go into the role of your Fraser Ennings of the world and start doing the dead cat on the table stuff. That's when 
the well, conversation the can de get dangerous. I mean, they, these things are not really um, radical that they're saying. You know, these are kind of um, really harmful, mainstream ideas that mm -hmm. are out there, you know, that are a transphobic or a rape apologist mm -hmm. or whatever. You know, we've kind of been fooled into thinking that they've been disinvited because they're too radical. And it's this really bizarre situation where it's, you know, Jermaine Greer is an icon. She's done incredible work in her lifetime, but she is no longer radical. She now is almost on par with the Fraser Annings of this world. And that's the reality well, that a lot of people saying, have grown up with. How do you go with. beyond radical? Um, what, what, what is the next phase? Well, what, what I'm saying is it's really... Um, what I'm trying to say is that the idea that they have been disinvited because they represent some kind of niche, radical perspective that we need to hear and unpack is just bizarre mm. because mm. They, they simply don't. They're people who could command a stage almost anywhere in the world. You know, you can't mm. censor someone who has an international platform. And so writers' festivals for many years have been these protected, very white, very middle-class spaces that are now starting to change. Artistic directors have always made these decisions, perhaps before they were made behind closed doors, and this may be an example of where they've said, you know what, we don't, you know, we, we want this to change. So, so just to clear it up, you, you think the, the decision may well be right, at least it's within the ambit of the director to decide? Yeah, well, what I'm, these are decisions that are the kind of decisions that are made all the time. It's just that these are particular people that are used to being handed any platform, hence the fury. I'll go to Mohammed. Uh, you, you will be at the Melbourne Writers' Festival. Your book is pretty contentious. I think you'd, you'd agree with that. Um, yeah, my book's contentious. And so I, it totally disproves the argument that these people have been disinvited because they're radicals. Plenty of radical thinkers are invited to the Writers' Festivals. I would love to... Because we talked to, a little to bit... To be fair, uh, Jermaine was not disinvited from the Melbourne Writers' Festival. No, the... She's just not in the country, but yep. it sounds like she wouldn't have been invited. But she was... Is she, was she not invited from Brisbane? Correct. OK. Um, I, don't, I, I would rather not talk about Jermaine Greer because we've said quite a bit about her yes, already. Yes, I would so... like to talk actually yes, more ahead. specifically about Bob Carr and, mm. and his relationship to the Brisbane Writers' Festival. Because, you know, when I was 13 years old, he was the Premier of New South Wales. And this was at the height of the, the demonisation of Arab and Muslim communities, specifically under the term Lebanese. And I remember one time coming home from school and seeing Bob Carr on the news. And he was saying, when I was a boy, he was saying to me, obey the laws of the country or ship out of the country. I knew that that comment was targeted at someone like me, a young Lebanese-Australian Muslim, because no matter how horrendous the crimes of white Australians may be, the politicians are never insinuating that the, that the solution is to kick them out of their own country. And I've got to say that when I heard that comment, I remember feeling extremely silenced and disempowered by the comments because I knew that my community, the Arab-Australian Muslim community, did not have the platform and the power to respond to that kind of bigotry. And so what I hope is that in this moment where Bob Carr has been temporarily silenced by a writers' festival, he is given the opportunity to reflect on what it's like for most people from minorities in Australia most of the time. Mohammed, uh, just talk about your book for a minute. So uh, the, the Lebs will be controversial uh, in some people's minds because it's, a, it's actually a, a quite a visceral account of the lives of these young men at Punchbowl High when you were there. So you experienced it effectively. It's autobiographical. Um, and they're pretty abominable in the way they treat women. Uh, they call them either sluts or virgins. Um, they offend a whole group of people. They're anti-Semitic. Uh, they're also funny. And I guess you're calling on a kind of tradition here of the Sopranos and, uh, you know, Mean Streets, Martin Scorsese's film. So you've got these conflicted and conflicting and sometimes violent characters. Um, but you're, but well, I guess the point is here is your privilege as a writer mm. to write about them because they're real. And we never get this perspective. Um, look, I, as, a, as a writer, I'm not interested in telling another positive story about Arabs and Muslims to counteract all the negative stories. My business as a writer is to represent the truth as I see it. And the truth of the experiences I had growing up is that we had a lot of antisocial behaviour in our community. Now, 
Um, one of the main bits of rhetoric which you're, you're touching on, Tony, in my book, in the Lebs, is that it's a confronting novel. And that's usually the, 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 the reaction that I get. People are offended, they're confronted. That's the, the words they use. And that's something that I can't apologise for. Because if you think it's confronting to read a book about Lebs, you should have tried being a Leb in the, in the year 2000. At the, at the height of the, of the media campaign, the political campaigns around the September 11 attacks, the SCAF gang rapes, and the way they turned all of us into sexual predators, gangsters, and terrorist conspirators. And so I have to speak the truth to my reality of what it was like at that particular moment in just, time. You mentioned September 11. I'm going to bring this up because effectively what happens, uh, September 11, 11 attacks occur, and... Some of your characters are watching and cheering uh, as the towers go down. Yeah, I mean, look, it's certainly true that at the school that I went to, which was 95% Arab Australian Muslim, even though it was a public school, was a, uh, was a school that was surrounded by barbed wires and cameras and our student body were under constant surveillance and pressure. And I do remember on the morning of the September 11 attacks that a lot of the young men were celebrating. I can't deny that or sugarcoat that just to protect my community. But here's the part that you have to contextualise and that you have to keep in mind. What happens at the school that day, which I write about in my book, is there's a young boy from a Palestinian background. The principal brings us all to the library and he tells us how disgusted he is with our behaviour in reaction to these events. Now, it just so happened that the school that morning had put the flag, the Australian flag, at half-mast. And... This young Palestinian boy put his hand up, waited for an hour to get to speak to the principal in front of the rest of the school, and here's what he said. He said, I've been a student at this school since 1998. In that time, hundreds and thousands of Muslims and Arabs like us have been slaughtered because of foreign policies in the West. And never once did the school mourn or grieve or show us any respect or dignity. And today, the events of September 11 have taken place, and you are going to mourn. But we don't want to mourn selectively like this. Yeah, uh, John, I'll just bring you in. You've been listening to this uh, mm. carefully, I know. Do you want to respond? Yeah, there's one thing that I think parents and teachers need to do, and that is to help each generation become better. I, I should make a point here. You're an educator. Yeah, um, you I run teach. schools. Yep. <laughs> and I'm just interested in your perspective of what we just heard. Yeah, I think we've got to he help each generation to be able to think more carefully and deeply and subtly and to weigh up arguments and listen carefully and be able to evaluate what people are saying. So rather than ban or censor the people who make extreme statements, we should be trying to develop the skill to be thoughtful about that. My favourite Aretha Franklin song is actually Think, even though some of the lyrics don't really um, reflect so well on what I've just been saying. Just the, the way she keeps emphasising, think, you've got to think, think, think. I like that because I think the more thoughtful we are as a society, then the more able we are to hear extremist views and to be able to evaluate them. And I'll just, I'll just make one more point too. It's about writers and novelists in this case. I mean, without... Mohammed writing a novel about his experiences in that school, very few of us would have a clue ah, yeah. what had gone on. It's like Maxine's book, The Hate Race, and it's like um, the, the Tall Man, the uh, great book by... Um, Chloe Hooper. Here. Is it Chloe Hooper? Chloe think, Hooper, yeah. yeah, thanks. Which have caused me to just have an upheaval in my own life and in my own mind. I've, I've, it's um, like an earthquake mm. where I've got to rethink everything and re-evaluate the Australia I thought I was living in. Mm. And that's great. It's healthy. It's really uh, good to be provoked in those ways because I think it makes me a better person, which is a, it sounds like a Hallmark greeting card slogan, but nevertheless... <laughs> Not at all. What, mm. um, let's move on because we've got a few questions left to still to go to. We've got one from Anna Stuckley, an important question. Where's Anna? Um, go ahead. How can diversity and insight in literature be provided by writers if they are restricted only to write about their own culture and not able to express their understanding and empathy of other cultures in their society? Sophie, I'll start with you on this one. Well, I didn't know that I was restricted f from writing about other cultures. I mean, um, I've written about... Um, 
from the perspectives of much younger people uh, living in ways that I don't live. I, I don't feel those kinds of restrictions um, to my imaginative world. But I, su I suspect you're talking about cultural appropriation. Yes. And, um, I mean, I am, you know, I am sensitive about that because I feel that uh, in Australia's short history of white settlement, there have not been enough Indigenous voices heard. I'm, I'm sure that's what you're um, talking about. And would you steer away from writing an Indigenous I, character? In your I would. You I, write from the perspective of, uh, of young children. I do. Uh, and it's a very I unique do. form of writing. Would you ever choose to write from the perspective of a young Indigenous kid? I wouldn't because uh, we haven't had enough of those stories. Mm. And um, until that balance is 100% addressed, I wouldn't be comfortable doing it. In theory, of course, um, you know, I believe in the world of the imagination and that's where I write from. But I wouldn't feel comfortable doing it with the way that it's been. Maxine? I think that there's this kind of... Um misconception around censorship and cultural appropriation. People can and do write whatever they want. A lot of the time when we're talking about not being able to write something, what we're actually talking about is general literary criticism. You know, when a book comes out and you say the structure is really bad or the story is really bad, now we are enlightened enough to say, does this accurately represent the kind of story that it's purporting to represent and is it harmful to that community and I think that's a genuine literary criticism so when you hear people saying I was censored often it's just that their book is bad they've done a terrible <laughs> job well you, you know, know that Lionel Shriver <laughs> sort of really kicked off this debate in 2016 at the Brisbane Writers Festival she gave a, a, an impassioned speech as it happened uh, Yasmin Abdul Majid walked out on it. Um... That, that speech was actually, and this was something that wasn't really very well covered. Lionel Shriver wrote a, book, wrote a book called The Mandibles. I don't know if anyone has read it here. Yeah. In that book, um, amongst other things, uh, a black woman was put on a leash, read, led around like a rabid dog and shot. There was kind of patois that was used to purport, purported to be Latin American kind of, you know, patois that made this kind of president of this... Um, country that she kind of con concocted looked very stupid. And a review came out in, I think it was the Washington Post, where a reviewer of colour said, this book is offensive, you haven't got it right, you've done a really poor job. Lionel Shriver got on a plane, flew to Brisbane, gave that speech, and what we had was a whole smokescreen. You know, this whole fact that this happened because there was genuine literary criticism of a book she wrote, which a lot of people of colour found quite appalling, has, has been lost. I mean, I don't think anyone knows that. We all just think that she put on a sombrero and gave a speech. So that, that was actually her response to someone saying, this is a poor book, was to say cultural appropriation. Well, no, you just wrote a terrible book, you know? <laughs> uh, Trent, what do you think? Uh, you know, my, uh, my day job is a long-form writer of magazine features for the Weekend Australian magazine. And I've been doing that for some time now. And every one of those, I think I appropriate someone's persona because that's how you write a good story and that takes empathy and sensitivity and care and I feel I'm able to do that if I have the respect of them and I've spent enough time with them the only difference between a non-fiction long-form story that I'm that I'm doing I'm not using I you know I'm not saying it's them it's but but I'm stepping into their shoes absolutely from the Dalai Lama to Jessica Mowboy to Bill Laurie to Gay Waterhouse this weekend. It's I'm stepping into the shoes of all these people. And I'd like to be in your shoe cupboard. That's a lot of shoes, isn't <laughs> yeah, it? It sure is. But like, but that's the beautiful thing you can do as a writer. Like I've, I dead said, I used to buy like Lifeline shoes and wear them because I have a fascination with literally walking in other people's shoes. And I think we start getting too touchy about who we can write about. I know that's bizarre. So, but um, <laughs> we, you know, Shakespeare did it all right. You know, he wrote about a teenage girl from Verona. He, he also wrote well about a, an elderly Jewish merchant. You know, I, I, just, I just think, you know, if you can do it right with, with respect and capture that person correctly, and it's, it's putting in the hard yards, though, that gets you there. Uh, uh, Mohammed, uh, it's an interesting one, isn't it? You're, you're, could anyone else, for example, write a book set in Punchbowl High? Because we know that SBS tried to do a TV series, um, which you've been very critical of, partly because they didn't get the humour right. 
Well, so to answer your question, no. No one can do it like me because <laughs> you... I mean, this is the... So can I... I mean, I'd like to try to answer the question. Sure, sure. Um, and I think it will incidentally answer your question too. It's about cultural appropriation. The, the debate about cultural appropriation, the basis of the debate is who is allowed to speak for who. And for me, as a teacher of creative writing, not just a writer myself, but as somebody who, who every single day works towards teaching other people how to write creatively and how to read, I'm not interested in what one person has to say about another person. I'm especially not interested in what a person from a privileged position has to say about somebody who is not privileged. My work as a teacher of creative writing is to give marginalised people the tools, the resources and the platform to speak for themselves. Can I just and, and, I just go, say something? Yes, go ahead. Would you not be touched or moved at all, Mohammed, if I spent a year stepping into your world, wrote my ass off to write about it and try and connect? Because I feel that could be a way to solve some of the issues. It's been done, and none of the issues have actually been solved. All the research in this area has actually already been done. You can't prepackage our liberation and hand it to us. We have to go through that process ourselves. And here's the thing about this question of me stepping into your shoes. The problem for me is that a lot of white Australian writers step into our shoes, and it actually makes it difficult for us to step into our own shoes and speak for ourselves. Mm. And when it mm. comes to Peter Dutton or any other politician making comments about the Lebanese Australian Muslim community, I'm sorry, but I'm not interested in hearing what another white man has to say about me. What about, what about the other way around? Um, can you step into his shoes and write about Peter Dutton, or are you restricted for the rest of your writing career mm. to writing only about your community? I think the thing is what you also have to look at is the structural racism within society and within the publishing industry. I mean, it's a miracle that the Lebs was picked up and was published by a multinational publisher. That's like a miracle of Australian publishing because it just doesn't happen. You don't get stories like that that are given that kind of a run. And when you have someone who hasn't had the disadvantage in life, who started, um, you know, miles ahead because of the privilege that they've had, because of the access that they have, because you know that the white, cup, the white face on the back of the book is going to sell 10,000 more copies, to then take someone else's story is... is you know, it's massive. OK, can, mm. can I just want to get Mohammed to answer that point. Could you write, for example, uh, a novel inside Peter Dutton's brain? Look, it's from a his perspective. It's, a, it's actually a really interesting question. Here's how I would answer it. And this is the most sincere thing I can say. That the, the, the debate about who is allowed to speak for who is fundamentally broken. Because, of course, you can speak for whoever you want. What I'm trying to understand, as a scholar who's been working in this particular area for the last 10 years is actually why would you want to do it? I have absolutely no desire to get into Peter Dutton's head. I'll tell you... But, 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 but. I want to answer. I'm OK, gonna... all right. Look, here's the thing, right? It's at, this is the actual debate that's going on. We need to be really transparent and honest about it. We don't actually have a problem in Australia with Arab Australians going to Indigenous communities and wanting to speak for Indigenous people. We don't have a problem with Indigenous people coming to Bankstown to investigate and research LEBS. We have a problem in Australia where one cultural group, and it happens to be the dominant white cultural group, think they have a right to speak for everyone else. OK, I'll just say one thing. If you do write that book about Peter Dutton, I'll buy it. Um, the next question is from uh, Abby Thivaraja. Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale, as far-fetched as it may seem, has many similarities to modern-day society and what the future may look like. What are your thoughts on this and how can we make changes now to prevent such a dystopian society from becoming our reality? Maxine. Oh, I think I read somewhere, and apologies for the person who I'm not attributing this to, but someone commenting on, the, on that series said that it's, it's a horror fantasy for white women and the current reality for a lot of women of colour. Yeah. Um, and I guess that that's, was kind of my... You know, there are a lot of things that I come to as a writer that I think this is actually too close to home. This isn't some strange uh, futuristic vision. Um, so for some people it's a warning and for some people it's kind of... 
it's almost life. Well, it was a reimagining of the Iranian revolution if you set it with fundamentalist Christians in America. So, mm. yes, when you say that it's the reality mm. for some women, it mm. certainly is in Iran, mm. or but, has been. But, I mean, not just in Iran. I mean, just, just the idea of, um, you know, for example, this kind of the using of bodies of certain women to carry babies. Mm. I mean, that, we're not just talking about Iran. We're talking mm. about a lot of women of colour across the world. Mm. So there are a lot of things, I think, that um, that invoke terror. And, I mean, this is, this is a good thing that literature can do. Depending on who you are, you, you have a different reaction to it. Um, but I guess it's something that I... I can't see a woman of colour writing that book in the same way. You know, in the same way that, you know, the, the homelessness series that's on television at the moment, if you've ever been close to being homeless, it's a very difficult thing to watch. The closer you are to that narrative, the more difficult it You're saying it because you digest. couldn't see a, a woman of colour writing it as a metaphorical story? Yeah, as, as yeah. an allegory, yeah. you know, as, yeah. as something that, you know, yeah. Mm. But, oh, sorry, well, go ahead, Sophie. I yeah. mean, your question, isn't it, what can we writers of fiction do? What, mm. what are our mm. tools and where does our power lay and what is it that fi how can fiction address the future? In, in, in... How can it prevent a dystopian That's future right. is what the question That's was. That's right. And interesting that it was Margaret Atwood's book that has, um, you know, that has led to this um, incredible series and this response to it. That was a work of fiction. So what is it that we can, can do? What is it that our work does that no other work can do? And I think, John, you put it so well, um, you know, fiction can get to the heart of, of a matter in, in a way that nothing else can. Um, but where does it, you know... I'm just thinking about its political Well, I'm, I'm, I'll take it a little further because I'm struck by the fact that all of you have written novels uh, based on children, the perspectives of children or the lives mm. of children, Trent, in your mm. case, um, mm. Mm. The, the really um, horrible, um, terrible mm. things that adults do to children. It's reflected in a lot of the writing on this table at the moment. Absolutely, yeah. Um... So you must have a sense that there's something there you're touching that will reach a lot of people and maybe change something. Oh, mate, I mean, you know, just between you guys and me, um, yeah, like my family for a brief period of my childhood we were kind of raised by southeast queensland heroin dealers um and it was a crazy old time and uh my three older brothers and i got kind of hauled over to brisbane kind of brackenridge housing commission kind of area and we lived there for 10 years and we we're sort of that was a sort of that was kind of a place that was defined by violence and alcoholism and and desperation and poverty and um and a lot of love insane amounts of love and um, insane amounts of solidarity. And I wanted to write about that world. And um, so I couldn't face it as a 38-year-old journo. Um, so I invented this kid named Eli Bell. And uh, he's 13 years old and he's this beautiful kid who's way stronger, way wiser, um, so much more savvier than I ever was. And that kid has shown me things about my own life I couldn't believe. And I came to the end of writing this thing and I realised the book was all about the wonder that children have in their minds. And, um, you know, it, it sort of, he, he gave me this profound kind of realisation about what a kid needs and uh, what a kid can show the world. And they're amazing kids, you know, you see it. You go out in my job and you see these amazing things. They've dealt with great trauma and largely in the outer suburbs of Brisbane. And, uh, and they're wondrous, you know, they, they can transform the worst pain into the greatest beauty. And um, I wanted to, but I knew that no one's going to read that story if it's a blow-by-blow, blow, you know, misery memoir about a kid in the Housing Commission of Brisbane. So why not throw in there a great adventure? Why not throw a story where it goes to the edge of the universe and comes back to true love and gives you the meaning of life? And it's like maybe the 14-year-old kid living in Housing Commission Brisbane will read that book. And, and, yeah, and that kid, Eli Bell, talking about what kids can give you, he gave me something and it's the answer to everything that a kid needs. And that thing, I never give parental advice, but you can take this to the bank. The one thing a kid needs is love and a quiet house. <laughs> and uh, that was a great lesson taught to me by a fictional 13-year-old boy. I go to Sophie because, Sophie, you go one step further and go inside the heads of your children so that they're seeing the adult world through their perspective. And mm -hmm. so what you get is their perspective, sometimes wrong, but, you, you know, violence and terrible things happen around them, terrible things happen to them. Mm -hmm. It's their perspective 
is limited to what they can see as a child. Mm -hmm. It's a fascinating way to approach it and um, obviously it's been successful. I mean, I don't approach it um, with a view to... Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm approaching it for some of the same reasons, really, that Trent is. I, it, it's a joyful, free, expressive sort of a space. Mm. So I'm not doing it to show lack. I'm not doing it um, because I want to show a system that fails a child. I'm actually doing it because I'm showing a little, again, like Trent, all that a child is capable of. And I'm, I'm, I'm showing the wonder and the magic and the power of this person's mind. So I'm not working, I'm not telling a story about limitations, but about possibilities. And that's what every child is able to teach us, oh, I think. Man. I've got to go to Mohammed again because your, your uh, main character is in the same sort of. He, he's confronted by terrible things around him, but he's resisting it. Um, it's, and he's trying to find his path with a conflicted identity. What's the question? Well, I want you to talk to that. Or um, you don't have to well, get can another I, can I, I can talk to you. Yeah. Is that, is well, that okay? I, I, I wanted to ask um, Muhammad by writing that book, the Lebs. Did that? What did that express for you? Did, did you feel that it addressed mm. some of, or, t or told your story in a yeah. way that needed to be told? Well, I think writers. The, the 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 first factor in being a writer is that there's something that you have to get off your chest, whether you're conscious of it or not, is irrelevant. But when I think about my writing and its relationship to children, because I have written from the perspectives of children. My, it's an autobiographical version of myself. But here's the thing. I'm not too sure if we should get too romantic about how powerful and significant it is to speak from a child's voice. I recognise the impact that literature from a child's perspective can have. But my work fundamentally is as an educator. And, you know, I draw from the philosophies of an important African-American cultural theorist, feminist, um, social activist and writer named Bell Hooks, who talks about literacy. She says, all steps towards freedom and justice in any culture are always dependent on mass-based literacy movements because degrees of literacy determine how we see what we see. And so if we're really serious, to me, about empowering children, our focus should be on making sure that every Australian child can read, write and think critically. OK. <laughs> Thank you very much. Time for one last question. It's from Laura Pangrazio. What do you consider essential reading for young people today? Which texts were formative for you when you were younger and how have they shaped your work? John Marsden, I'll start with you. We've got brief answers, really, because we're running out of time. Well, that's tough. It's, uh, there's such a range out there. And when you talk about childhood, one of the worst things we do is to sentimentalise and idealise childhood and then we demonise adolescence. And so if you can find books that are authentically in an adolescent or child voice, which shows the complexity of children and adolescence in an honest way, then uh, I'd, I'd, that's the list I'd be going with. But um, you'd need to do some searching to find those books. Maxine. Um, I think for me, if you're asking what those books were for me, you know, it wasn't the internet age, so you couldn't just kind of order books from overseas or whatever. So the books that turned up for me were things like Looking for Ella Brandy, Sally Morgan's My Place. These were kind of the only culturally diverse Australian books that it was like. And even, you know, Judy Bloom's Iggy House, Iggy's House. I read it now and I'm going, oh, no, Maxine, you know, how could you have loved that book? But it was like the only book with the black kids in it, you know, African diaspora kids, even though they're African-American. So those were the books for me. Um, but now I think um, Australian literature is in, in, in a wonderful place. You know, you have um, Alice Pung, Amberlynn Kwe Malina. There are some really phenomenal people writing for young adults in Australia. Um, kids today are lucky. Trent. Uh, the last two pages of Grapes of Wrath change anyone's life in a flash. You probably want to read the rest of the book as well. Read the, read the rest of the book up to those last two pages. It's the most amazing act of Choices Under Pressure that I spoke about. Just the most beautiful scene ever. And um, completely changed who I was as a human being and as a man and, um, and as a journo. Mohammed. It's not what you read, it's how you read. Mm. What do you mean by that? Um, OK. We, we live in extremely troubling times where the rise of imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy threatens the existence of all organised human life. And the only way we can counteract that as critical thinkers is to make sure 
that we are engaging in literature, in reading and writing that is as diverse as the world that we want to see. S Sophie. Poetry. I think poetry. I think children should be encouraged to write a lot of poetry and to read a lot of poetry. OK, that's a good brief answer and very sage advice. That's all we have time for tonight. Please thank our panel. Uh, John Marsden, Maxine Beniba-Clark, Sophie Laguna, Michael Mohammed Ahmed and Trent Dalton. Thank you. Thank you very much. And a uh, very special thanks to the Melbourne Writers' Festival and this audience of keen readers. Uh, you can continue the discussion with Q&A Extra on News Radio and Facebook Live, where Scott Wales is joined by the author of Beneath the Mother Tree, DM Cameron. Now, next Monday, Q&A will be live from Mackay in Queensland with prominent Nationals backbencher George Christensen, uh, One Nation leader Paul, Pauline Hanson, returning Green Senator Larissa Waters, the only Labor MP in Northern Queensland, Cathy O'Toole, and leader of the Catter Australia Party, Bob Catter. It's a special all-politicians panel showing the choices facing Queenslanders in the next election. And we're expecting some vigorous questions from the voters of Mackay. Until next week, good night.